Hi, Dr. Osborne here with Web Wellness University. Today I want to talk a little bit about vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is one of the essential nutrients that humans require to sustain normal function. And the only way we can really get it is through our diet. Our body can't synthesize vitamin B12 on its own, so we have to get it from diet. What's important to understand is that the only valid source of vitamin B12 is meat, animal products. So I may be busting a lot of vegetarian bubbles out there, but without meat, you're not really going to be able to get adequate bioavailable vitamin B12 in your diet, and so then you're going to suffer the consequences potentially of vitamin B12 deficiency. There are a number of different things that we know of that can cause a vitamin B12 deficiency. And so obviously, one of the biggest factors that we see is gluten sensitivity. Gluten actually, one of the components that, or one of the ways that gluten can impact or affect vitamin B12 is through the stomach. Your stomach Okay, is lined with a type of cell called a parietal cell. Now, parietal cells have a job to do. That job is they make acid and they make a chemical known as intrinsic factor. Now, what's important to know is that when you eat meat to get your vitamin B12, the acid in your stomach that's produced breaks the vitamin B12 off of the meat. Once the B12 is freed up, it's bound to that IF or that intrinsic factor. Think of intrinsic factor the way you would think of a taxi cab. That intrinsic factor carries vitamin B12 down through your small intestine where it's then absorbed into your bloodstream. So if we don't have adequate acid or we don't have adequate intrinsic factor, we actually can develop a vitamin B12 deficiency even if we're eating plenty of meat. So parietal cells can actually be damaged, okay, by gluten. That's actually one of the mechanisms of gluten-induced vitamin B12 deficiency. We also know that acid, right, the acid, once the parietal cells are affected, that the acid levels can drop in the stomach and that the intrinsic factor levels can drop as well. Now one of the other things that we found, it's an autoimmune disease known as pernicious anemia. And pernicious anemia is when your immune system starts to attack intrinsic factor. and as gluten is highly related or highly associated with induction of autoimmune disease, there's also this correlation where gluten can impact the immune system's attack or the, immune, the effect that the immune system has toward intrinsic factors. So there's actually two mechanisms that gluten sensitivity can induce in terms of creating a vitamin B12 deficiency in the stomach alone. Now, if we talk about the small intestine, we also know that villus atrophy associated with celiac disease can also lead to malabsorption of B vitamin, vitamin B12. So there's really three mechanisms from an absorption standpoint that gluten can impact with vitamin B12 in both the stomach and small intestines. So that's one mechanism of how gluten sensi or of how vitamin B12 can become deficient. Now one of the most common side effects of gluten sensitivity is heartburn. And so sometimes when a patient develops heartburn, what happens? They go see their doctor and they get prescribed Nexium or Propulsid or Tagamet, these are medications that reduce acid. So we're talking about acid reducing blocker or acid blockers, right? And when we reduce stomach acid, just like we saw here, we reduce the body's ability to absorb vitamin B12. Now, sometimes even not going to the doctor, but taking drugs like Tums or Rolaids, those over-the-counter antacid medications can also contribute to this problem. And so we got to be really careful. If you have heartburn, it's instead of just accepting, hey, I have heartburn, I need to take this medication, you may just ask yourself why the heartburn is there in the first place. And there are a number of reasons why that can happen. And uh, the things that I would initially investigate are infection, oftentimes helicobacter pylori infection, which is a type of bacterial infection, can cause heartburn. But also we can have different food allergies and food intolerances that can induce heartburn. So you want to rule those things out before you just start blindly taking a medication that's going to impact your stomach acid and subsequently impact vitamin B12. Now, so we've got gluten sensitivity can cause a vitamin B12 deficiency. We have heartburn that can cause a vitamin B12 deficiency. One of the other things that I commonly see clinically is we see chemo treatments for cancer uh, inducing vitamin B12 deficiencies. So 
If you're undergoing chemotherapy, if you're undergoing cancer therapy, one of the primary nutrients you want to make sure you're getting high enough doses of is vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 has a very, very important function as it relates to cancer. One of the things that happens with chemotherapy is that the stomach and the intestines become very irritated, very upset, and basically the lining erodes away because uh, one of the mechanisms of chemo medication is that it actually inhibits vitamin B12 and folic acid, folic acid being another B vitamin. And so with chemo patients, one of the things it's very safe to do, it doesn't interfere with the medication, is to take high doses of vitamin B12, 10,000 to 15,000 micrograms of vitamin B12 a day would not be out of, uh, out of the ordinary for somebody undergoing this type of treatment to try to prevent the nausea and the stomach issues and the intestinal issues that chemo patients commonly have. Now other things can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, for example, not eating enough meat, vegetarianism, but also other things that can cause vitamin B12 deficiency, high levels of sugar in the diet, um, inadequate um, in eating foods that are hard to digest, and so that causes an excessive uh, burden or a excessive effect on the parietal cells of the stomach and their ability to digest. Pancreatic insufficiencies can contribute to vitamin B12. So a number of components that can contribute to B12 deficiency. Now, why is all that important? Well, if we look at vitamin B12 deficiency and the symptoms that can come out of that, one of the main symptoms that we see the first two symptoms clinically, before it shows up in the bloodstream, before lab tests detect vitamin B12 deficiency, we see uh, depressions, but we see depression. And I mean depression as in sadness, depression as in mental depression, right? And so a person will feel lethargic, they'll have brain fog, they'll be depressed, they won't have energy, they won't have motivation, they'll feel like they really just don't want to get out of bed today or really don't, aren't motivated to do a whole lot. The other thing or I said there's two common symptoms, one is depression and the other is fatigue. So these two will generally show up first. And uh, these kind of are symptoms when a person has a doctor commonly, what will they do? Well, we'll get a prescription for medication, right? We'll usually get a prescription for some type of antidepressant medication. What's interesting is that antidepressant medications can cause folic acid deficiency. And so now, Folic acid deficiency, just like vitamin B12 deficiency, can cause depression. So we don't want to take a medication without discerning the origin of the depression, without discerning the origin of the fatigue. And so it's important to understand this concept. Now, vitamin B12 deficiency, one of its other uh, very common symptoms that we see develop is a neuropathy. Now, neuropathy is nerve damage. And so generally what we'll see, and nerve damage can, can happen to any type of nerve. We have motor nerves which control our our muscles, right? We also have sensory nerves that detect vibration, sensation, and touch, and feel, right? But we also have nerves in our brain. That's why the neuropathy, oftentimes the depression, is a form of neuropathy. But we tend to think of neuropathy as the inability to feel. And so we think of diabetic neuropathy when we lose the sensation or lose the feeling in our feet. Well, vitamin B12 deficiency can cause that. If you suspect that your vitamin B12 is deficient, have your doctor, there's a very simple test you can have your doctor run, and it's a vibration sensation test. It's a little vibration tinning fork he can put on your toes to detect early loss of vibration sensation. That's one of the first neuropathical signs of a vitamin B12 deficiency. So again, neuropathy can develop, and sometimes we'll also get acute nerve pain with B12 deficiency. So you can have sharp shooting pains traveling down uh, nerve distributions in your arms, your legs, your feet, etc. So neuropathy, another symptom of vitamin B12 deficiency. Another symptom is anemia. When, when people think of anemia, most often they think of iron deficiency. Well, vitamin B12 deficiency can also cause anemia. Now, there's three types of anemia. Uh, that B12 can cause. One of it, it, one of those types is low white blood cells, one type is low red blood cells, okay, and another type is low levels of platelets. These are all just different types of anemia. And so what happens is if we have low levels of white blood cells, that's going to suppress our immune function, and now our immune system is not going to work as well as it should, so we can get suppression of immune function with vitamin B12 deficiency. When we have a red blood cell anemia, in essence, when our red blood cells we either don't make enough or we're, are the red blood cells that we're making are not maturing properly because B12 plays a role in both of those elements, what ends up happening is we don't deliver oxygen to the brain, we don't deliver adequate oxygen to muscle tissues, and so this deficiency, this type of anemia can cause, again, 
the same thing we see over here, which is that fatigue, that fatigue, that mental lethargy, that inability to think clearly, that mental fog or brain fog, that can be caused as a result of the anemic complications of not producing adequate red blood cells. And remember, red blood cells' job is to carry oxygen through the body. So we can get that anemia and we can have that, that oxygen deprivation. Now the other thing that oxygen deprivation oftentimes causes is muscular pain because the muscles require a large degree of oxygen to function normally and so when they're deprived, and again we're not saying that the muscles are completely void of oxygen, we're just saying they're not getting enough. Well when that happens, muscles go into spasm. When they're in spasm long enough, we get a buildup of chemicals that can actually stimulate nerves and cause pain. So this anemia can lead to a lot of your muscle pains and aches as well. And then we can have platelet disorders. And low levels of platelets can be quite a, a clinical dangerous situation uh, because what happens, platelets are what clot your blood. And so if you're not producing adequate amounts of platelets, if you get a cut, you can bleed and the, and the, and the bleed out won't stop because your, your body's not making enough platelets to clot that blood. So that can be quite a dangerous situation. So we've got, again, we've got depression, fatigue, we've got nerve damage, we've got anemias that can all occur as a result of vitamin B12 deficiency. So it's very, very important again that if we're having symptoms associated with any of these conditions, we ask our doctor to look at vitamin B12. And again, I've said this before a number of times about other nutrients, but we don't want to look at serum B12 levels because they're not very accurate. They're not a good marker. They're not a good indicator for the B12 that's inside your cells and B12 where it works is inside your cell. It doesn't work in the blood, it works inside your cell. So we want to have a way to measure the, the vitamin B12 in the bloodstream and the way we do that is through lymphocyte proliferation. There's a good lab out there called SpectraCell. So make sure your doctor's familiar with SpectraCell lab and ask him to run an intracellular, intracellular vitamin B12 analysis. Then that way you can get a better marker or a better determination of whether or not you have a vitamin B12 deficiency. Now on another side note, if your doctor is not familiar with SpectraCell, there are a couple of other tests that he might be familiar with that would also be helpful for you to ask him to run. One is a test called um, methyl malonic acid. Okay, and the other one is a test that most doctors are aware of these days and that is called homocysteine. So these are just two other ways that you could have or you could indirectly measure whether or not vitamin B12 might be low. Again, they're not as accurate as the spectrocell intracellular analysis, but if your doctor is not familiar with that and not capable or set up to do that type of testing, these are two other types of tests that you can have him look at. So the final thing that you want to understand Again, you want to know whether or not you're having a vitamin B12 deficiency. You want to know whether these types of symptoms are linked to this before you take medications. What happens if you are vitamin B12 deficient? Well, there's a pretty simple solution. One, eat more meat. Now, if you've got a problem potentially with one of these other components up here, then that needs to be further investigated. But if you need a form of supplemental B12, the kind of B12 that works best for humans is methyl cobalamin. Now if you're taking some other form, one of the most common forms in supplements used today is a, is a form called cyanocobalamin, C-Y-A-N-O cobalamin. And that form is, is a, it's not as easy to assimilate for humans as methylcobalamin. So this would be the ideal form of supplementation that you would want to use. And if you need a good source of methylcobalamin, you can click the link below this video and there's a link where you can find a good source of methylcobalamin uh, to supplement with. So I hope this video was helpful for you and I hope you have a great afternoon. Dr. Osborne out. I will talk to you next time.